Hi, and welcome to module two in the Food Zoomers training modules under the Vibrant Functional Academy. In this module, we are going to cover corn zoomer, soy zoomer, and seafood zoomer. Um, hopefully you've already watched module one where we went through the immunoglobulin basics and proteins versus peptides um, in order to understand the foundations of these food zoomer tests. So the corn zoomer um, basically is going to include peptide level assessment of the proteins found in corn, especially the most antigenic ones. And this is kind of an example of what you might see on a corn zoomer report. This is the list of markers that are being measured here and we'll walk through the important points you'd wanna know about various markers. So some of these are going to have some connections to wheat. Um, there are actually a few on here that either gluten or wheat have overlap or cross reactivity with. Um, corn zane is a protein in corn that actually induces a gluten-like cellular immune response in some celiac disease patients. So this is not so much a cross reactivity than it is that this protein has a similar type of immune response that uh, gluten does or gliadin specifically for celiac patients. So if you have a celiac patient that is gluten free, obviously, but is still experiencing some degree of um, villus atrophy or GI inflammation, consider running a corn zoomer simply because corn is one of the most common grains that gluten-free individuals consume um, because it's sort of that you know next best thing. So this might be something to think about there. There's also corn wheat overlap epitope. And what that means is that this is actually a protein in corn that is also similar to a protein in wheat. And individuals who are wheat sensitive typically also make antibodies to this protein. Um, this is something that could show up as somebody who perhaps you've already run a wheat zoomer on and they have eliminated gluten and are still symptomatic and perhaps you've even rerun that wheat zoomer just to confirm they're not consuming wheat uh, because that happens. People are not always um, aware of the cross-contamination or sometimes they're just not really being that straightforward and honest about perhaps those foods occasionally being eaten. So in the cases where individuals are actually truly wheat free and they're still symptomatic uh, when consuming other grains or gluten free foods, consider that this may be one of the mechanisms at play that there is this protein found in corn that is similar to proteins found in wheat and individuals who make antibodies to this also should be corn free. Um, so in both of these cases with corn zane and corn wheat overlap epitope, perhaps a grain-free diet would be more appropriate um, unless you know individuals find that they do okay tolerating rice or buckwheat um, or millet, other gluten-free grains. There's also the corn cry proteins. Um, so this, the, the corn zoomer and the soy zoomer both test for GMO varieties of these particular proteins. So these are proteins used in the manufacturing um, of genetically modified organisms. They are BT strains of corn. And so essentially this is a toxin derived from bacteria that has been genetically modified into particular varieties of corn in the United States primarily. And it acts as a defense mechanism for the plant so that the plant is resistant to um, pests. The, this corn cry protein antibodies have been found to this in pregnant women, um, children, basically all populations at this point. And it's not really known exactly what the long-term consequences of this are, however, individuals making antibodies to corn cry proteins definitely should not be consuming GMO corn. Now, this is the only protein measured here that would be found in GMO corn, but not organic corn. Everything else on the corn zoomer, any antibodies to those proteins 
would indicate that all corn needs to be eliminated. Um, so keep that in mind. If you have an individual that has only antibodies to corn cry proteins, eating organic corn would probably be okay for that person. However, any other marker on the corn zoomer being elevated would be a total corn elimination, whether it's organic or not. So just to reiterate, persistent symptoms in wheat sensitive individuals who are already on a gluten-free diet could be due to their consumption of corn-based foods, which is the most common alternative to wheat. There's also going to be antibodies to corn zane um, that will remain elevated until both corn and wheat are withdrawn from the diet. So upon retest, if an individual has gone wheat-free but not corn-free, you may still see these antibodies elevated in a patient. Corn wheat overlap epitopes are found positive on the wheat zoomer, um, which indicates immune stimulation from both corn and wheat. So again, both grains need to be eliminated. And those individuals may just feel that a grain-free diet is a little bit better to follow. You may just want to assess the patient for how appropriate that diet is based on their level of compliance. And then also consider a corn zoomer if you have a positive wheat zoomer and symptoms continue to persist after going on a gluten-free diet. There's also cross-reactivity between corn thyroidoxin and wheat thyroidoxin and grass pollen thyroidoxin. These particular proteins are similar in structure and this is related to Baker's asthma. Um, it may indicate the need to eliminate wheat if it has not already been eliminated. <clears throat> so if you have run a wheat zoomer and, and the wheat zoomer perhaps is not positive, indicating that the individual doesn't really need to eliminate wheat or gluten, but a corn zoomer is, and you see corn thyroidoxin elevated, wheat may also need to be eliminated in order to reduce or suppress the, the asthma-like symptoms that, that could appear in those patients. If the patients don't have asthma-like symptoms, this may not be of concern. Corn lipid transfer proteins have a high degree of cross-reactivity with peaches and rice, the lipid transfer proteins in those foods. So this is a case where going corn-free may not be enough, peaches or rice may actually stimulate similar symptoms in individuals who have antibodies to corn lipid transfer proteins because those same proteins are similar in peach and rice. Corn endochitinase has a high rate of homology with grapes and um, may lead to cross-reactivity and clinical reactions. Again, when an individual goes corn-free, after running this test, if it's indicated, if they have these antibodies to corn endochitinase and they consume grapes, they may get similar symptoms simply because the protein structures in those foods are the same or similar. There are, of course, other proteins tested on the corn zoomer. These are not, not antigenic. They're not completely not inflammatory. However, they are less well studied. Um, connections to chronic disease or cross-reactivity with other foods are not as well known. And so these are just considered less antigenic, but still very relevant um, in either case. So antibodies to any of these other markers would still warrant at the very least rotation of the food, but commonly eliminating it and depending on how reactive the patient is, possibly long-term, but possibly also reintroducing at some point after healing the intestinal barrier. Also on the full version of the report, um, if, you're, if you're not looking at the full version of the report with all of the comments that populate, I would encourage you to pull that up and just check out the lists of foods to, ha to, to avoid. Um, hidden sources of food. These are helpful for the patient, especially if you're going to have time during a consult to discuss these things um, as far as giving your patient guidance about what to avoid and what foods might have corn hidden in them. Corn is probably just as ubiquitous as wheat in the American diet as far as everything it's used in and its hidden sources and how much it's a filler. So going corn-free can be just as difficult, and um, often that takes some practice. So giving your patient as much of a, an advantage as possible.
There's also a guide that has similar information. Um, this will be available for download on the portal, um, the education portal, where you can access some of these additional references. So let's move on to the soy zoomer. Um, again, very similar to the corn zoomer and all the other food zoomers, we're going to have basically the, the IgE component to assess for whether or not an individual is allergic to the food. Again, that's a whole protein or extract level um, allergy test or IgE assessment. That's the only protein being tested here. The rest of these are at the peptide level. This is your lists of you know, the proteins found in soy that are being tested for. Some notable things, um, there's a few of these on here that are associated with soy dust sensitivity. Uh, so when inhaled, that can produce asthma-like symptoms in some individuals. Inhaling soy dust is not that common unless someone works in and around foods or in a manufacturing environment where soy dust is being generated. Typically, this is not a concern for the average consumer. Um, there is also a cry protein assessing for genetically modified soy. Again, this is the same type of situation as with corn. Um, this, is, this is basically used to provide protection for the plant against pests. However, this protein often remains intact and it crosses an intestinal barrier that is leaky, so to speak, or permeable, and can get into systemic circulation and cause inflammation. Um, there's also a good degree of homology between certain proteins in soy and those in peanuts and tree nuts. And so these particular proteins, GLI-M5 and GLI-M6, when you see these antibodies elevated on your patient's report, it might actually be a good idea to go ahead and run a peanut zoomer or a nut zoomer to see if perhaps there's some type of a cross reactivity between these foods for that particular patient due to the structural homology between these proteins and those in peanuts and tree nuts. Um, of course, soy is certainly one of the foods that can exacerbate skin conditions such as eczema or dermatitis. So there's definitely a connection between GLI-M BD30K, which is one of the proteins or markers measured on the soy zoomer. Um, this is found, antibodies to this are found in higher rates in individuals who are soy sensitive that also have atopic dermatitis. Um, so what do we do with the results? Similar to the other food zoomers, you're going to eliminate your IgA moderate or positive foods, you know, pretty, pretty much immediately. You would wait to introduce those after you've confirmed the intestinal barrier is healed. So you would want to see a clean intestinal permeability panel. You wouldn't want to see any zonulin, um, actin, or LPS antibodies. If you just have IgG moderate to soy, depending on the symptoms of the patient, um, this you may, if the, if the patient doesn't have atopic dermatitis, doesn't have soy dust sensitivity or asthma-like symptoms, it may be appropriate to eliminate the food for 30 to 60 days and then consider rotating it once you've retested that intestinal barrier and confirm that it's healed. If you have IgG positive antibodies, that would be a longer term elimination, just given that it takes a little bit longer for IgG antibodies to cycle out of the system and, and return to normal after a food is eliminated, so possibly up to six months. Again, you're going to use your best clinical judgment and decide if... Um, you know, perhaps it is appropriate to reintroduce the food based on the patient's particular situation. Um, if there are gastrointestinal symptoms present, if there's, you know, the atopic dermatitis, uh, some other things to look at would be looking at a lectin zoomer to assess reactivity to soy lectin. Um, as we reviewed in module one, we went through reasons for running the lectin zoomer, one being that we're not looking at individual food lectins on these food zoomers with the exception of wheat zoomer. Um, so the lectin zoomer could also give you some insight into whether or not an individual has soy lectin sensitivity um, as just a further layer of their clinical presentation.
So then seafood zoomer. Seafood zoomer is a fairly extensive test. Um, there's quite a few varieties of fish and shellfish being tested here. Um, I won't walk through every single one of them, obviously. So one of the most common questions that gets asked about seafood zoomer is whenever antibodies are present to Anisakis simplex, um, what does this actually mean and what do I need to do about it? Anisakis simplex is a parasite that's found in seafood, especially undercooked or raw seafood. So individuals who are eating sushi, for instance, are probably at greater risk of being exposed to this parasite. Now, as with all parasites, not everyone has an immediate, acute, um, very strong reaction to this particular parasite. Some individuals will and some won't. Um, some individuals are sensitive to the parasite and antibodies to the parasite on the test just simply indicate that the parasite is what they have been exposed to and they have made antibodies to it. There may be a parasitic presence from Anisakis simplex, um, but, but antibodies to it do not necessarily indicate that it is actually present in the gastrointestinal tract. A tr an Anisakis simplex infection is actually an acute infection, generally hospitalizes patients with symptoms that mimic a bowel obstruction. So this is something that is incredibly painful and they are hospitalized in the emergency room pretty rapidly when they actually become infected with Anisakis. So it's not likely that a patient is walking around with this active infection. If you're seeing these antibodies on the seafood zoomer, what you're seeing is mainly that this person has been exposed to Anisakis simplex through the ingestion of raw seafood and they carry antibodies to it. So what that means is that when they eat seafood that has Anisakis simplex in it, it's going to trigger inflammation for them simply because they are sensitive to the parasite and not to the seafood. So this is important to understand. Seafood zoomer, same type of situation as corn zoomer and soy zoomer and the other food zoomers. Um, IgA moderate or positive, you would want to eliminate those foods right away, confirm the intestinal barrier is healed before reintroducing any of those. Um, the IgG moderate and IgG positive, it's going to be based on your clinical assessment of where that patient is, how reactive they are, um, other foods to consider. And then again, of course, with Anisakis simplex, if those antibodies are present, the best practice is for someone to definitely avoid raw or undercooked seafood, um, but perhaps also avoid seafood for you know, three to six months, depending on which type of antibodies you see and how elevated they are. And that is it for Food Zoomer Module 2. And the next module will go over Egg Zoomer, Peanut Zoomer, and Nut Zoomer.